How many have you heard about stem cells lately? How many have heard about cloning lately? What's that got to do with the Bible? You say, is there, is there genetic manipulation in the Bible? Yes. In fact, you will not understand most of the Old Testament unless you really understand who the Rephaim really were. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So we're going to explore the biotech revolution. I like to call it the new sorcerer's apprentice. Where are we going? Well, there appear to be long sought remedies emerging for many of the diseases that have been most elusive in our society in all kinds. Um, in fact, there are astonishing advances that are emerging in molecular biology, including, of course, the ultimate one is cloning. The idea that we'll actually be able to clone human beings, you've got to be kidding. No, the serious scientists are expecting to do that within a year or two. In fact, there are articles that they're expecting cloning baby factories and so forth. Uh, this is not fringe stuff. This is centerline uh, weirdness. Um, now, when you start seeing them growing human ears on mice, you ought to get uncomfortable because uh, there are some very serious concerns emerging by those that are best informed in terms of cross-species diseases and the rest. But there's also, we believe, some biblically relevant implications on the horizon. Our agenda will be briefly to look at this, first of all, uh, in terms of a panacea. We'll talk about the tissues. We'll do just a quick tutorial on the human cell and uh, some of that and the code of life because I think there's some tremendous lessons for us all there. But then we'll also talk not just about the tissues but the issues, what we're concerned about. We'll talk about what I'll call the dark side. Have we really opened a Pandora's box? We're tampering with the engines of creation. What are the prophetic implications of that? Now the reason I call a Source's Apprentice, most of you are familiar with the Desarbeling uh, Magic Student thing by von Goethe that was made into a musical piece by Paul Dukas in 1897 called The Source's Apprentice, which was of course popularized in Walt Disney's Fantasia. That's why I use it as, a, as a, a frame of reference for us, because you may recall the whole idea of that piece of literature was that a student so, uh, uh, created a spell uh, and didn't get it quite correct. He unleashed forces that be, was, be, were uncontrollable, and his teacher finally had to intervene to terminate the impending disaster. That's basically the theme that w uh, occupies that music but it's also exactly what seems to be going on here. We're starting to tamper with things that are out of our control and it's going to take our designer's intervention to straighten the mess that we have out. If we were going to map a perspective of our physical reality, say, start, start, uh, starting with the human body, which of course is composed of organs, the organs are composed of tissues, the tissues of cells. Within the cells, that's what I want to focus on a little bit, we have a miniature city full of molecular robots and so below that atomic structure, some atomic particles, and we finally get to the boundaries of reality itself as we discover that subatomic particles have no, ro no locality. We'll talk a little bit about that. But the cells and these molecular robots are something that we each need to be a little bit more aware of. So I'd like to talk briefly about um, what I call a constellation of miracles, the miniature city that we call the cell. Now, Michael Denton summarized this very well in his work back in 1986. He says, although the tiniest bacterial cells, although they're incredibly small, each is in effect a veritable micro-miniaturized factory containing thousands of exquisitely designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery made up of a hundred billion atoms, far more complicated than any machine built by man and absolutely without parallel in the non-living world. The simple cell, all of us in school, probably saw a textbook that had a little diagram of what they call the simple cell. It turns out there isn't such an animal. The simplest cell is more complicated, it's beyond our imagining. It, is, has, it has a central memory bank, it has assembly plants and processing units, it has repackaging and shipping centers, robot machines in the form of protein molecules that consist typically of 3,000 atoms in three-dimensional configurations and there's hundreds of thousands of different kinds of these machines that make up the, the composite. And they communicate with elaborate communication systems that we have yet to understand. And they also have quality control and error correcting mechanisms. Now, if we were going to make a model of a simple cell, let's assume we decided to embark on a project to build a model of a cell 1,000 million times larger than life. Well, that would make each atom about the size of a tennis ball. We would need 10 million million atoms, about 10 to the 13th 
That's quite a number. If you, ha if you had to count them at one per minute, it would take you 19 million years to count them. That's a lot. And this model that we would make would be over 10 miles in diameter. You get a feeling that this thing is big and complicated? Absolutely. Now we speak of the cell, we glibly make little diagrams saying that, well, it's surrounded by a plasma membrane. What we fail to realize is that in that membrane are gateways with special signal receptors and security guards to monitor what goes in and goes out. The center of the cytoplasm, of course, has as its core as its nucleus, which is its information center, which includes a master library with which everything uh, is coordinated. Inside that, we have automated factories and product manufacturing facilities. Now, we have rope. This thing is populated with robot machines of hundreds of thousands of different types, as I said, and they communicate by means of digital languages and decoding systems memory banks for information storage and control systems for regulating all this and indulges in prefabrication and modular construction and has proofreading and error correction devices for quality control. Now, as some of you know, I spent six years of my executive career at the Ford Motor Company. In, at Ford, we were very proud of our very unique facility in Dearborn called the Ford River Rouge uh, plant. Now, this is a plant that's the largest integrated ma manufacturing facility in the world. It has about 100 miles of railroad within the plant. Under one roof, they receive raw limestone, raw iron ore, and coal going one end. They manufacture under that roof their own steel, their own glass, their own paint. They have an automated plant that builds the engines. They have a manufacturing line for all the rest. They assemble the mixed models, different cars of different kinds of different colors, as you all know. And anyway, the point, the raw materials go in one end, new cars come up the other. It's, a, it's considered the largest integrated manufacturing facility in the world. The reason I bring it up is the cell, your simplest cell, is more complicated than the River Rouge plant. And your cell can do something the River Rouge plant can't do. It is capable of replicating its entire self within a few hours. Your DNA is about six feet long, and, and it's all wrapped up in a microscopic um, location. Now, most of you have seen computer models or representations. I want you to notice this double helix of the DNA is, is, um, consists of a, like a ladder of code pairs. Three out of four of these code pairs will define any of the 20 amino acids that make life possible. This is an error-correcting digital code. If you know anything about computer design, you know that couldn't happen by accident. It had to be very skillfully designed. See, life is digitally defined, and that's what Genesis says in Genesis 1.25. It says, God made the beast of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth after his kind. They are digitally defined. They're not analog, they're digital. What do I mean by digital? It's like a watch. If you have a watch with hands, that's analog. If you have a watch that says, uh, uh, you know, you have 39 seconds left in your talk, it's a three and a nine, you know, um, that's, th those are digits. They take their meaning by arbitrary definitions. They're, des they're, 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 they're designed, they, can't they, 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 don't hand them ran they don't happen randomly. Now see, the ultimate technology are thoughts expressed in language. You need to discern the difference between the technology of content and the technology of conveyance. There's a difference between the technology to get a radio signal to your home and a television set and the technology that may be involved in the play or the software that you're watching, if you will. The manuscript versus the media, if you will. Did the ink write the book? You can talk about binding paper and ink. It's got nothing to do with the technology of the manuscript itself. Is it in German? Is it in English? Is it whatever? Is it music? Is it text? you follow me? Totally different technologies. Now, the code of life, of course, the DNA, and I'll just zip through this. We just recently mapped the 3.1 billion letters in the human genome thanks to the competition between the private sector and the government consortium and they're five years ahead of schedule. They're expecting a gold mine of medical breakthroughs through all of this but the, the frontier science really isn't microbiology, it's information science. This designer baby saved his sister. Colorado couple used genetic tests to create a test tube baby that would have the exact type of cells desperately needed to save their six-year-old daughter.
we've just recently mapped the 3.1 billion letters in the human genome, thanks to the competition between the private sector and the government consortium, and they're five years ahead of schedule. They're expecting a gold mine of medical breakthroughs through all of this. But the, the frontier science really isn't microbiology, it's information science. They need to study coding systems that are more sophisticated than most of the cryptography that occupies our National Security Agency. Let's take one example. Let's take hemoglobin. Your hemoglobin is 574 amino acids long. These 574 amino acids have to be in the right sequence. You have 36 of these are glycine, 68 are alanine. Of the 20 different types, you have a total of 574. Now it turns out from mathematic, mathematical switching theory, you can tell what the chances are of getting that right by accident. To make a long story short, you have with 574 elements chosen from an alphabet of 20, you've got 10 with 650 zeros after it as your chance, do it, get it by chance. Now here's the point. If you get it wrong, that's called hemo, uh, uh, hemoglobinopathy. It's, it's, it's fatal. Sickle cell anemia is a derivative of this. In other words, they have to be precisely right. Could that happen by chance? Mathematically impossible. You want, you want 10 to the 650th power? There are only 10 to the 18th seconds in the history of the universe if you accept the 15 billion year history of the universe that the scientists talk about. There are only 10 to the 66th atoms in our entire galaxy. There are only 10 to the 80th particles in our galaxy. 10 to the 650th power. See, in physics, anything that's more rare than one chance in 10 to the 50th is defined as absurd. So 10 to the 650th is not anywhere in the realm of having been occasioned by chance. It had to be designed and designed very skillfully. Now there's an idea that they were indebted to Michael Behe for the concept of irreducible complexity. How many of you ever handled a mousetrap? It has five parts. For years they've tried to make a better one. It's pretty hard. They have a wooden platform, a hammer, a, a spring, a holding bar to hold the hammer back and a catch to hold the holding bar. Five parts. You have to have all five to catch a mouse. If you have four of the five parts, you don't catch four-fifths as many mice. <laughs> okay? That's called nonlinearity. You need all five. Follow me? That's called irreducible complexity. Let me give you an example in real life. Here's a bacteria. It's a single-celled creature that has a little tail that propels it through fluids, right? Here's a diagram of it. I won't get, it's a single-celled creature. I want to look at the place that the flagellum joins the cell wall. Here's a, a microphotograph of it. It has, it's an electric motor. It has D-rings, it has multiple armatures, it has a double wall protection. There are 40 parts to this, any one of which is missing, it doesn't work. It's an example of irreducible complexity in real life. Here's the equivalent electrical diagram of it. Any one part missing, it's busted. Did this happen by chance? Hardly. Very skillful design. The real issue, the reason the Darwinists can't explain the origin of life is because they cannot explain the origin of information. The origin of information. Which came first, the DNA or the proteins? You can't, it takes protein to construct DNA. And you takes DNA to construct proteins. Which came first? Come on, guys. You know, both had to be created at the same time for, and designed to a consistent system architecture. Those, that same code, those same acids, are the ingredients of all life in the universe, which proves it all came from the same design team. It came, all came from the same software house. Okay? All right. Psalm 19, we all know the first four verses. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Now, what's interesting about this passage is the information science emphasis. The heavens declare, day they utter speech, knowledge, speech, language, words. Information science is the issue that underlies all of this. See, the origin of information can't be explained. The irreducible complexity refutes design by chance or accident. The choreography of the chromosomes defies any random theories. Digital codes demand pre-planning. No system dependent upon subsystems can survive random failures. It takes design, skillful design. Well, let's move on.
We've talked about the tissues. Now let's jump into some of the issues. We're tampering with the engines of creation. I want you now to stop and put yourselves in this picture. By the way, anyone that thinks that some of these ethical issues are simple are naive. You have, put yourself in this, you have a six-year-old daughter or son who has a rare bone marrow disease, anemia, bleeding disorders, severe immune dis problems, and likely to die of leukemia within the year. Can you picture that? Try to put yourself in those shoes. Your doctor tells you that there's a 90% chance of curing your child through a cell transplant technique from an umbilical cord of a matched sibling, which requires, of course, the use of a screened embryo. What would you do? What would you do? Would you take advantage of that? Of course you would. This is an actual case. Molly Nash was born with Fanconi anemia distant for leukemia. The only effective treatment known is to get a batch of healthy cells from a perfectly matched sibling to replace the child's faulty bone marrow cells. And since each parent carries both a normal and a faulty version of the Vanconi gene, each pregnancy has a 25% chance of having an affected child subsequently. So what did they do? They created embryos by standard in vitro fertilization in a laboratory dish tested for the presence of the disease gene. Only those testing normal are then transferred to a woman's uterus. Only two of 15 tested were normal. And only one of those two was healthy enough for transfer to Lisa Nash's womb, which they did. This designer baby saved the sister. The Colorado couple used genetic tests to create a test tube baby that would have the exact type of cells desperately needed to save their six-year-old daughter. She now has a 90% chance of being free from malaria disease. Genetic screening is clearly going to be part of our society, our culture. And that little girl is healthy today. Her baby brother, that was, whose umbilical cord was used, he's also doing fine. So the family's doing fine. So this is, this is real life stuff, and it's going to be more and more. See, we're dealing here with the issue of differentiation. There's a very strange mystery that goes on in cytokinesis. If cytokinesis results in identical ch cells when they split, why do they differentiate? If two become four, and four become eight, and eight become 16, and so forth, identically, What's happening when they suddenly start differentiating? Because you know what happens. Pretty soon you get some different ones. There's a dark line goes down the middle. It's the backbone. And as the time goes on, you have, of course, these identical cells differentiate into 210 different types of cells that become the tissues that make up the organs that make up the embryo. Now, what you, one of the crafts here is to take a nucleus from some other or, uh, uh, entity and take this nucleus out of the stem cell, put that nucleus in. It's called uh, a nuclear transfer. That's what we call cloning. And you end up then with a replica of the donor. And that's what, that's what cloning is all about, properly called nuclear transfer. And we all know about a clone in sheep's clothing, the famous dolly sheep in Scotland. A needle-making machine is the key to the whole thing, where they were able to remove the nucleus and, ins and insert a nucleus of a, nucleus of a donor and the, the uh, dolly, the sheep, is a, a replica of the original donor, uh, born on a surrogate mother. What they don't tell you is it took 277 failures along the way before they got one that worked. Cloning has become common. They now do it to monkeys, they do it to pigs and uh, cattle, and it's widely practiced for and great experimentation going on. And uh, the, one of the mysteries is why do they, replicating cells, differentiate? They don't know yet. Now, genetic engineering involves the manipulation of stem cells to produce desired tissues. And of course, nuclear transfer being cloning makes complete beings. And of course, there's huge moral, ethical, legal issues here. One of the questions that you're going to have to ponder some, somewhere along the way, when does tampering with an embryo become murder? Is it acceptable to clone a baby to save a child's life? That was the moral dilemma the Colorado couple had to face. When does human life begin? How will clones affect our society if there are cloned human beings running around? Will they be second-class citizens? Will they be a differentiated group? Daniel seems to think so. I'll come back to that. But can a human clone be come saved? A lot of good theologians will have different points of view on that. What's also interesting is that same concept is embodied in the ancient legends of virtually every ancient culture on the planet Earth. The Greek Titans and all that are all... 
When does, let's talk a little bit about the dark side. Is this a panacea for mankind or is it a Pandora's box we've opened? Now let's not get reactionary. These guys are going against very, very serious objectives to try to find cures for AIDS, mental illness, autoimmune diseases, obesity, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, Blue Gehrig's disease, heart disease, and of course cancer. The leading cause of death after heart disease is cancer, 24%. 40% of Americans have already or will have cancer. 20% will die from it, 30% caused by smoking, 30% by poor diet and lack of exercise, spending too much time on speaking platforms. <laughs> and there's also remedies being sought for things you and I can't even pronounce. One of the concerns is that there are very few safeguards against errors or abuse during the research. This research is not being done in controlled environments, not being done in government labs, not being done in large corporate facilities. It's done by garage startups all over the world. Thousands of companies being formed by the month, all over the world, not just in the US, to experiment in this area in a race for patents and insights. And as they start messing around with cross-species uh, uh, games, you're gonna find that there's unknown diseases and complications emerging. And uh, I use this little mouse as perhaps one of the more grotesque examples. The potential for self-replicating mutations are all impossible to fully anticipate. And of course, there's few procedural disciplines. Uh, there's small, intensely competitive laboratories and, and so forth, very few controls. We're tampering with the human genome. Has this happened before? Yes. In Genesis 6. And also after that, Genesis 6 warns us with the Rephaim and so forth. The days of Noah that Jesus talks about, the days of Noah that are associated the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. What were the days of Noah like? And what did Daniel mean when he talked about the miry clay? It's been there all along. I've never noticed it in verse 43 of Daniel 2. We'll take a look at that. And what implications might have this for some of the strange goings on we see in, Gen in uh, Revelation and elsewhere? Genesis chapter 6, the first two verses are a single sentence. Everybody misses that. Genesis 6, verse 1 and 2 are a single sentence. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the B'nai HaElohim, the sons of God, a term used exclusively for angels in the Old Testament, saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Weird goings on. Notice these are the same sentence that avoids a lot of other errors. B'nai HaElohim, it is always used of angels, and uh, it's in Job and other places. Um, in the book of Enoch, which is useful for grammar and, and, and uh, vocabulary of the period. The Septuagint, the translation of the Old Testament into the highly precise Greek, three centuries before Christ was born, clearly identifies this term as angels. A few verses later, he explains what the results were. There were Nephilim in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, the same became the mighty men which were of old men of renown. I thought angels had no sex. That's not what the scripture says. It says the angels in heaven don't marry. It's a different statement altogether. I won't get into that here. We'll keep moving. The Nephilim it comes from the word the fallen ones, from the verb nephal, to be fall, to be cast down, to fall away, to desert. Nephilim are the fallen ones. These are the hybrids. This was Satan's strategy to corrupt the human race to prevent a Messiah. Yes, they were giants, but in the Septuagint, the word was translated gigantes, which is transliterated giants in the English. They were giants, but that's not what the word means. It means earthborn. In the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, we find a similar term called the Rephaim. Sometimes translated giants in your English, sometimes translated dead. You might appropriately call them, if you look at all the verses and put it together, the living dead. Strange creatures. Why did God tell Joshua to wipe out every man, woman, and child of certain tribes? because they had a gene pool problem. One of the things that brought about the flood of Noah was a gene pool problem. In Genesis 6 verse 9, it tells us one of the distinctives of Noah was that he, had, he was a just man and he was perfect in his generations. And the word there is tamim, which means without blemish, sound, healthful, without spot, unimpaired. It's used of physical blemishes. And, uh, well, we'll keep moving. Jesus, in his prophetic discourse, his confidential briefing to his four disciples in Matthew 24 said, but as the days of Noah were, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. Now what he may have meant is simply that it was business as usual until they went, entered the ark. Many scholars would see it that way. But others who have studied this carefully also feel he was saying something more than that. And uh, 
it's interesting that the classical view of Genesis 6, what's called the angel view, these are fallen angels bent on mischief, was the view of all the ancient rabbis. It was the view of the early church up until the 5th century. But the 5th century emerges an alternative view because it was a little less spooky and a little more comfortable called the Lines of Seth. And that is the view that's taught in most seminaries today. The tragedy is had absolutely no scriptural support. The fallen angel view is the view of the ancient scholars, Hebrew scholars, the view of the early church. It prevails among conservative scholarship today and it's confirmed in the New Testament in Jude and 2 Peter. What's also interesting is that same concept is embodied in the ancient legends of virtually every ancient culture on the planet Earth. In Sumer, Assyria, Egypt, Incas, the Mayan, the, the Epic of Gilgamesh, Persia, Greece, India, the Greek, the Greek Titans and all that are all echoes of the same kind of shenanigans way back in the mystery uh, early chapters of Genesis. The, South, the Sioux Indians, um, we could go on and on. When you talk about Hercules or Atlas of the Greek mythology, you're talking about what the Hebrews would call Nephilim, the unnatural hybrids. The early church fathers held that view, modern scholarship. Uh, also holds that view. Satan has strategies, you can look at the Bible as Satan's strategies to corrupt the human line. And uh, the population of Canaan, we have the post-flood of Nephilim, that's mentioned in Genesis 6, it happened also after that, after the flood. And they're encountered in Canaan when, jo when uh, Moses sent the 12 spies. They came back in Numbers 13, 33, says there are Nephilim in the land, these fallen ones. And, and we are like grasshoppers before them. We're pretty hard on those 10 guys. Remember that Og, the king of the giants, was 13 feet tall. Think about going up against a warrior like that. The serious problems, the Rephaim, these were a race of giants, except they're more than just giants. We encounter them in Genesis 14, 15 and following. The Moabites called them the Emim, the Ammonites called them the Zamzumim, there's others. The same term is also translated dead. Isaiah tells us that they're not eligible for resurrection. Strange thing. We have Aunt Arba and Anak and his seven sons, the Anakim. We have Og, the king of Bashan in Deuteronomy 3 and, 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 and so on. It's interesting that Joshua is told to wipe out every man, woman, and child of those tribes. He does almost. But the places that he fails to do so, in the Golan Heights, in Gaza, Ashdod, and so forth, it's the places that the PLO have their conclaves today. Strangely, strange stuff and Goliath and his four brothers. We took a four by four up in the Golan Heights. There is a monument up there that's sort of like a Stonehenge called Gilgal Raphaim. It's never been excavated. We know very little about it. What's strange is you can only tell what it is from the air. It's about five circles, 20 ton stones, dated about 3000 BC. It's on a flat plateau, only visible from the air, about 10 miles. And there's a number of these that have never been excavated, never been studied yet. King of Og, Og uh, in the kingdom of Bashan, which reigned in Ashtaroth and Indra, the remained of the remnant of the giants, that is, the, the word giants there is actually the word Rephaim, for these did Moses smite and cast them out. The king, the, the, Bashan was the final region of these Rephaim. And um, the, the king of Bashan had an iron bed nine cubits long. That's somewhere between 13 and 16 feet, depending what cubit you use. There's a passage in Daniel, most of us are familiar with Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar's polymetallic image, the gold, silver, brass, iron, iron mixed with clay, you all know that. In Daniel 7, there's a, a, another vision given to Daniel directly, different idioms used, but the same subject, basically the sequence of empires, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and then Rome in two phases. Most of you have studied this, but I want to focus on something strange, and that's this iron mixed with clay. What on earth does that mean? Now, I, for, for many decades, I, like most conservative Bible scholars, have taught that clay is people. You're the potter, I'm the clay. It's an idiom. It's actually in Aramaic. It's miry clay. Daniel explains the miry clay. The miry clay is clay made from mire, or is dust. Dust is usually synonymous, idiomatically, with death. Whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, Daniel switches to a personal pronoun, they, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. This, the grammar here requires that the they have to be something other than the seed of men. Whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, 
Daniel switches to a personal pronoun, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. This, the grammar here requires that the they have to be something other than the seed of men, or it doesn't make sense. What are they? I don't know. Are they Nephilim? That would echo maybe what Jesus said as the days of Noah were, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. Or are the they the results of genetic manipulation that's gone awry? Don't know. The context of Nebuchadnezzar's dream implies that they constitute a political constituency. They're numerous, not just a few exceptions. Now, there are three technologies that we're trying to follow closely. One is what's called nanotechnologies. This is in the computer field where they're learning how to make molecular-sized robots, machines. They can make machines that do things. Very primitive at the moment, but they're working hard in that area. The goal of nanotechnology is to make molecule-sized machines. The goal of robotics, that's another field of study, their goal is to make self-modifying sentient machines, machines that we can reprogram themselves, in other words, computer-driven uh, devices. There's a third field called genetics, whose goal, in part, is the self-replication of manipulated entities. Now, what's spooky is you've got to recognize that these three technologies are destined to converge. The nanotechnologists and the robotics and the genesis all talk to each other, and they all have something to contribute to each other. What is the goal of the convergent technologies? To create self-replicating, sentient machines capable of directable diseases targeting specific groups or individuals. It seems feasible to engineer a virus that will attack only certain combinations of DNA, certain genetic groups, or maybe even individuals. There are people in history that if they had that technology, it would be terrifying. There's the, the most audacious of all these projects that I've run into is the Clone Jesus Project. There are serious people that are going to attempt, or are attempting, to get a DNA sample from some appropriate religious relic, do a nuclear transfer to a stem cell, and there are 40 women that have volunteered, virgin women, that to, to be the surrogate mother. One of these projects claims a target date of December 25th of this year. Now this may just be a fundraising scam. I wouldn't put too much on it, but, and it's also, in, at this stage especially, of, of technology, absurdly risky. Dolly took 276 failures, and those failures put the mother at risk, not just the embryo. Now, the other side of this is kind of, I think, kind of amusing. If they use the Shroud of Turin to try to get one of these DNA samples, which is one of the speculations, they may not get the guy they think they're getting. There are a couple of scholars that believe, they may not be right, but they believe that that shroud is the Shroud of Jacques de Molay. He was the, land grand, he's the last grand master of the Knights Templar. He was executed in a parody of the crucifixion back in 1314, and there are some scholars that think that's really where the shroud came from. So if they're right, and they succeed at getting a clone here, they may not get the guy they were thinking they're getting. And of course, this is going to be, there's already novels starting to come out in which they try to clone Jesus, but really get the Antichrist and that sort of thing. But there is a strange verse in Revelation 17, verse 11, most of you that have studied Revelation 17 come across this verse speaking of the beast that was and is not, and even he is of the he is the eighth, but is of the seven and goeth into perdition. What does that verse mean? I have no idea. I've, I've studied Revelation for 40 years and I've read all the conjectures, and there's, but none of them really have impressed me too much. I'm not sure what that means. And there's many conjectures, as I say. But from the point of view of genetic engineering, you read this now, it may have a whole different complexion than was anticipated in the past. The beast that was and is not, even that's the Antichrist, if you will, he is the eighth, after seven that have been talked about, he is the eighth, but is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Is he a clone of one of the other seven? Could be. Who knows? Interesting. 
One comment I will make as you study the restrainer in 2 Thessalonians 2, I believe the restrainer in 2 Thessalonians 2 is restraining far more than you and I have any capacity to imagine. Every time I've studied the scripture and discovered that I have to repair some view I had of previous years, and there's been a number of times I've had to do that, it's always been in the direction that I didn't take it literally enough. The more I've studied the scripture, the more I've been driven more and more to take it more and more literally. I go through Revelation today and take it even more literally than I ever have. If I was going to make a movie of what I thought the world would be like right after the rapture, I don't think it would be believable because I think it's going to get weirder, stranger, than we have any capacity to imagine even with all our special effects and science fiction perspectives. And uh, I think the, the world is going to get really bizarre. And I'm glad that if you're in Jesus Christ, it's academic, you'll watch it from the mezzanine, right? Uh, I'll leave you with one last thought, and that's that we live in hyperspaces in the first place. Nachman in the 12th century said the universe has, from reading Genesis 1, he said the universe has 10 dimensions, only four are knowable. That was his view. Particle physicists today tell us that we do live in 10 dimensions, only four are directly measurable, linked with height and time. Six are curled in less than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. If you, read, if you look at our thing, learn the Bible 24 hours, our perception of Genesis is that the 10 dimensional universe was split into the physical and what we call the sp physical and spiritual realms. And uh, many of the things we may be experiencing may be trans-dimensional uh, phenomenon. David Bohm was a protege of Einstein and one of the world's most respected quantum physicists. His land he did landmark work in plasma physics. He believed at the subatomic level, locations seemed to cease to exist. It's like the universe is some kind of giant hologram. John Bell, back in 1964, formulated a mathematical approach to demonstrating, to explore the possibility of non-locality. It wasn't the technology then, but 1982, Alan Aspect and his colleagues at CERN conducted a landmark experiment. They demonstrated that subatomic particles have no locality. And I won't go through the physics of this. They took photons going in opposite directions with filters that switched fast enough that they demonstrated that the photons, all photons, know what the other photons are doing instantaneously. And that means they have no locality. Anyway, so the whole, our whole concepts of reality uh, are being altered. We're discovering that we all are in a gigantic simulation. And if you want to understand one colorful entertainment piece, I encourage you to rent a movie called 13th Floor. It's just a piece of entertainment. It's a clever, it's a clever script. I think relatively well performed, but it also gives you a whole different perspective of our own, uh, our own uh, society. But part of our threat, the myopia of our life is that we are force-fitting discoveries into obsolete models. And uh, again, in the interest of time, I'll skip into this. Um, I think man is invading a world of which he has only the faintest glimpses. And the uncharted impacts can replicate unseen. They can transcend borders, species, and generations. And only the most committed people can persist in denying the role of a deliberate designer or creator. And we need to uh, recognize that you and I were fearfully and wonderfully made. For thou hast possessed my reins, the psalmist says, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being incomplete, and in thy book all my members are written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. When did God first start dealing with you? Before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1.4. God bless you.